you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I always like talking to fellow autonomous driving enthusiasts. Uh, my name is Matthew Johnson Robertson. Uh, I'm the current director of the Robotics Institute here at Carnegie Mellon and, and a professor in the School of Computer Science. Um, uh, I want to talk to you about sort of my two cents on autonomous driving and, and a bit about uh, directions that I see that might be interesting moving forward. Um, but I always like to start by kind of framing this uh, in the context of the fact that this is a sort of very old field and it can often feel like it's, you know, everything is changing and it's all very rapid and all very new, but, you know, this dates back um, really in, in the world to the sort of 1940s, 1950s as a concept that people were excited about. So this is a, an image from around that time uh, predicting that people would be able to play dominoes in their car while uh, not having to drive. Um, we're not there yet, uh, but I like to highlight that there's sort of a sort of long and rich history of, of this kind of work. So this is a project from RCA in the 1950s, um, and they were able to produce autonomous vehicles that um, controlled steering using metal cables embedded in the roadway. And so I always like to bring this up to kind of highlight, well, you know, there are two ways of trying to solve this problem. One is changing the infrastructure and the other is putting more intelligence in the vehicle. Um, we focused very heavily on the latter in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. But I'll say um, as, a, as a thought for the future, um, you know, uh, there were some really creative ideas around infrastructure back then and you may uh, see a resurgence of that as we move forward um, to our autonomous future. Um, again, you know, to kind of highlight the long trajectory of the field, that project from RCA in the 1950s and 60s, but lots of academic projects in the interim. So the ALV project, VAMORS, that was in Europe, uh, Argo, NavLab, the, all the NavLabs one through five, those were at CMU, um, and then Stanley at uh, Stanford, uh, sandstorm moving all the way up to the urban grand challenge um, in uh, the mid 2000 aughts. Uh, anyway, uh, the reason I like to highlight this is that it often feels like um, you know everything is new, but people have been doing particularly camera and lidar based driving really intensely since the 1980s and 90s, and so. Um, we have to temper our expectations that we're all going to get there all at once um, in, in some ways because it's been a really long journey. You know, one of the things that I liked about this workshop is sort of, you know, putting forward some benchmark data sets. And one of the things I often think about is sort of the differences between computer vision as a field when we think about, um, you know, problems like ImageNet and how that's kind of catapulted us forward to where we are with AVs. And we're getting some really, really good canonical data you know, Kitty probably being um, uh, this one that kind of, uh, one of the challenges again is always this, this challenge around static data, right? And so we run on static data and we produce results that really isn't a reflection of what autonomous driving is directly, right? Autonomous driving is the interaction between uh, making decisions and the environment around you. Um, and I think we always need to keep that in mind. So um, I, I keep pushing us, um, and I think we're going to hear some other talks about, you know, ways of thinking about more dynamic simulation and how that would fit into our larger um, challenges around getting the miles necessary to prove safety. Uh, you know, so if we think about, you know, ImageNet as the sort of computer vision world, what's the robot vision equivalent and how do we think about robot vision? And so you've provided these lovely data sets here or, or others have provided them uh, to this workshop. But again, um, Thinking about the dynamic nature of, of driving, I think we still need to keep pushing forward. Um, so great milestones, um, but a long way to go. Okay, so, you know, one of the challenges is all those data sets are very expensive. And luckily, companies with lots of uh, money in the bank have uh, spent the time uh, to label them. But again, I think uh, from my perspective, one of the big challenges is how do we escape that? You know, a new LiDAR comes out every six months, every year. Um, the thought that we're going to keep paying for labeling these data sets over and over and over again seems like it's going to be uh, a lot, right? So um, we need to think about ways of escaping that. And so I'm going to propose a few right here, which is going to be self-supervised and unsupervised learning a little bit. Um, I think physics is another big escape. I'm not going to have a ton of time to talk about that, but uh, I'll just sort of wet your beak on that. And then finally, simulation. Uh, so this is work. Um, first work I'm going to present you is uh, from student money in my group uh, who just graduated uh, and he's um, going to be moving on uh, to a postdoc. So that's exciting for him. Um, but one of the things he's really been focused on is thinking about all the challenges in perception, right? Everything from smoke and fog to glare to darkness to motion blur. 
And those are really some of the challenges that we have to address when we think about the long tail um, in autonomous driving. Um, so I think it's an important aspect of that. Um, he wrote a paper called Failing to Learn, and it was about uh, autonomously identifying perception failures. And so I want to focus on that just as a, as a teaser to kind of get you thinking about ways that we could provide self-supervision as opposed to um, you know, needing to hand label everything. The concept is incredibly simple. And so uh, again, really this, this serves as sort of a, a driver for, for thought, I think. But the idea is you know, we obviously have, uh, in this case, pretty simple mounting box detections, right? And we also have lots of trackers that are you know, floating around in your, in your standard AV stack. Um, and the proposal was just, well, if we know we have a single shot detector, um, can we use tracking information to provide feedback on detections we miss? So what that means is if I get a shot detector and then my tracking tells me that it propagates to the next frame, but my single shot detector fails to detect it in that new frame, I know that there's a high likelihood that that is probably something that I missed. And so another way of thinking about this is that temporal inconsistencies are, are hypotheses for missed detections. And so if we think about moving from time t minus two up to time t, we get a series of detections. We also have a series of tracks for that same period of time. And everything that is not included in that other um, set of tracks or not in, in detections that's not in tracks or vice versa rather is a hypothesis for detection, right? The problem is that all hypotheses are not valid errors. So you have to think about a way of filtering this down. Um, he produced a binary classifier that used some hand design features um, that did a pretty good job. But again, I think one of the important pieces of this, right, is that you can do all this without thinking about the underlying image features. So you can make it agnostic to the detectors that you're using or the trackers that you're using. And so really what we want to put forward here is a framework where we begin to think at fleet level about how do we understand the error rates of the systems we're seeing, right? Without having to go through and hand label things. In that same way, we propose that stereo inconsistencies are also hypotheses. So if you have a left and your right image, it's from Kitty, you know, and you have a detection in one image, uh, because we have a small baseline stereo system, you know that there should be a detection in the other. We use the disparity map uh, to project that through in space um, and get us to uh, where that detection would be in the other image. Um, and, and then he ran it on pretty large data sets. And you can see uh, in the green, and those are failed detections that he was able to identify successfully um, that were just missed. And that's over there on the left in um, uh, robot car from Oxford. And then over there on the right, um, you can see the same, right? So you can see that things like saturation and auto exposure, which really change the image parameters um, uh, lead to these missed detections, right? So every green one you see is a missed detection um, that we were able to correctly um, pull out just using this sort of approach. Uh, another thing I think is interesting about this, and I'll kind of circle back to this with the next work we talk about, right? But the correlation of errors can be thought about in a geospatial sense. And why that's important is you can begin to think about macro trends in your systems. You can think about, well, do I always miss detections at this intersection? Do I always miss detections at this time of day? Do I always miss detections in this direction? And those sort of meta details, I think, are, are really, really important. We begin, again, think about the long uh, uh, tail, again, of trying to solve some of these A-B problems. Okay. Uh, so of what he's moved on to, and I'll just tease this because it's still sort of uh, cooking in publication, but he's been thinking a lot about um, uh, thermal cameras and how to use thermal cameras in a variety of ways to sort of vehicle perception. Uh, so he built up a ladder rig along with a couple thermal cameras, a really, really high quality thermal camera, and then a much lower cost uncooled microbolometer. And then he has been taking uh, data in the snow. Luckily in Michigan, we have tons of snow, which is great. Um, so in those pretty crappy conditions. And what you can see here is a ladder point cloud in the center, RGB up there in the upper left, but two things that may be less familiar. So one is the ADK, which is that low cost thermal camera. And you can notice a number of factors there. One is a high degree of sort of fixed pattern noise, a high degree of blurring, and just sort of lower uh, quality image. Um, but what's powerful is that, that image you see down below, which is the high quality thermal camera that's, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, it's cooled down to a very low temperature and probably isn't realistic for deployment on AV um, in, in practical senses. But what we're trying to do is think about ways of mapping from that high quality thermal space to that much cheaper and sort of noisier thermal space. And so that's work that's sort of ongoing. Um, yeah.
so again, that FLIR uh, camera, you know, 20K, the, there's another one that's even higher cost, um, but really this low cost one, these uh, uncooled uh, cameras, we think that that's going to be one of the things that might be really, really relevant in the future. Um, uh, yeah. So anyways, here's just some more imagery of that. Think about that 80K um, uh, versus what you can see in the cool thermal camera. Great. Okay, stay tuned to that. He's done, stay tuned for more work from him on that, but he's done some really preliminary work thinking about deep blurring thermal images. And I'll just tease this so I can move on to kind of the next topics. Uh, but he's done a bunch of work already on that uh, kind of low cost thermal camera to decrease um, the blurring that you're seeing in those images, um, which is going to be really important if you want to use it for detection or other things on moving vehicles. Great. Uh, next piece of work I'm going to tell you about is from a graduate graduated actually PhD student. That's what that should say, Ming Yuan Yu. He's now at Ford. Um, uh, and he's been thinking about sort of risk on the macro level of uh, autonomous driving systems. You know, so one of the things that humans are really, really good at is learning how to understand risk to them as they drive around. So you'll see him pulling up to this uh, uh, cross traffic intersection here, peeking out a little bit so he can get visibility from the left and the right, and then making that left turn. Right, uh, And that's an incredibly intuitive thing that humans do. So we thought, well, is there a way of, of modeling that and then producing control inputs that, that kind of simulate that same behavior? Uh, so the motivation here is risk assessment, right? How do we evaluate the risk that may be involved in any possible activity we may undertake with the vehicle? And then what are the motion planning um, sort of maneuvers we want to do to mitigate that risk? Um, yeah. So what you'll see here is that blue car is the ego vehicle. That's us. That's the car that's driving. The red car is a, another vehicle traveling on the road. And then that yellow star is where I'm planning on turning in this four-way intersection. And what you can see in green is that is the visible cone. So we simulated a very simple LIDAR. And then we did some you know, visibility calculation using ray tracing to understand where that vehicle in blue can see. Um, and, and the power of this is that you can do this based on intersection layout without actually having to have a ton of real data um, beyond what you can get from publicly available map data. But the idea is what can we say about what we can see and what we can't see in a deterministic way such that we can produce a probabilistic estimate of where the highest risks are for different intersections. Um, so here you have uh, that same scenario. You'll see the blue car pulling up or maybe not. Yep. Here we go. Uh, so the blue car pulls up, it wants to make that left-hand turn. And each of those red dots is a potential vehicle um, that could exist in some world where we can't see currently. And you see, as we get higher visibility into ranges, into areas, um, we get a greater understanding of what each of the probabilities of each of those um, uh, potential vehicles is, right? Uh, so basically what this means is that we can make better estimates of where we wanna go based on what we cannot see. And so we use the visibility of the environment to make decisions about what maneuvers we should do. It's the sort of uh, way of uh, formalizing as a particle filter that intuitive understanding we had of, well, I can't see around this intersection, so I need to pull out and look at it. Great. So how does this work? And uh, practically, well, what we do is we calculate a forward reachability, right? So there's a forward reachability set, which comprises all of the dynamics of the vehicle that we're in currently and where it could possibly end up. Once we calculate that forward reachable set, we can do the same for other vehicles that aren't the ego vehicle, right? That says that these vehicles can end up in these locations in this time uh, horizon and use that to understand where collisions would be uh, by projecting into the future. Um, and you can do this all pretty fast, which means that I can calculate, okay, this is where I'm going, that's where that red vehicle is going, and so that red vehicle and I are not going to intersect in the future. And that's great because I can see where that red vehicle is. But the kind of key and kind of non-intuitive part of this is, well, what if there's a red vehicle with that same forward reachable set just outside my visibility window, right? So my LiDAR can't see it, it's obscured by the buildings on that corner. And that means that I don't have visibility there. And so I need to be perhaps more cautious or at least understand and quantify the risk to me by proceeding through this intersection without being able to see where that vehicle is. So this makes certain underlying assumptions, right? It assumes that vehicles are traveling in the lane they're supposed to be traveling. They're supposed to be traveling at the speed limit. But I think those are incredibly reasonable assumptions to make because you can say, if you get into a collision with a person that's speeding double the speed limit, or you get into a collision with somebody that's traveling the wrong direction on a one-way street, uh, those are scenarios that I think you have to accept uh, with an AV. That's kind of a, a level of risk that you have to tolerate, otherwise you really wouldn't be able to drive safely. 
uh, or at all, rather, I guess. Uh, so those are all possible vehicles that we can't see, right? Um, and then what's beautiful about this, I think, is that you can look at any intersection and you can make certain assumptions about speed, your speed, speeds of other vehicles, and then determine lots about the risk uh, associated with uh, traveling through that intersection or making a left-hand turn or making a right-hand turn or going straight. Um, and so we did this uh, over many, many, many intersections, over an entire city, and, and the power of this was being able to look at a macro level at where the highest collision rate intersections were. And so by looking at where the highest collision intersection rates were, you could map a vehicle, um, vehicle's path through a city, avoiding these really, really high risk intersections. Great. Okay. So I promise to talk about simulation. Uh, so this is much, much older work where we hacked into the Grand Theft Auto V and produce lots of data uh, and then use that to train uh, classifiers to detect things. So great, you can vary the lighting conditions, you can vary the fog, the volumetric uh, information, um, and you're able to extract all the labels automatically um, uh, through great pains in this scenario. And I'll kind of circle back to this at the end and talk about why we did it this way and where I think the future of this is going. Uh, but long story short, it ends up working pretty well because GTA had a lot of artists spent a lot of time producing fairly photorealistic data. Um, and so you can produce lots of really, really interesting scenarios where you have things like shadows and dusks and partial occlusions and just visible cars and all things, kind of things like that. Um, and then also some false positives, right? Um, but uh, ultimately what we did is then train on that data, 200,000 of those images, which you see down at the bottom. Uh, and then we cross-trained um, uh, the same detectors on another uh, real data set, cityscapes, and you can see that up uh, there on the cityscapes, tra cityscapes train data, we actually perform much worse than we're able to do with this really, really um, uh, high number of uh, simulated images. Great, uh, as you increased up to 500K, we kept seeing performance benefits and then some mass and toting after that. Okay, cool. So a, a natural question would be like, well, that's great, but we have the simulated data. It doesn't really look like my real data. So if another graduate student uh, who just recently graduated and now is a research scientist over at Ford as well, uh, Alexa, and she's been thinking about um, for a long time, uh, the sort of sim to real problem. And so she's a paper modeling camera effects to improve visual learning from synthetic data. Uh, and then, you know, this is uh, sort of an idea that's been toyed with uh, a number of times. So here we, we focus on using physics to take uh, simulated data and then make it look much more like real data. And so the underlying sort of approach here was to say, well, there's a number of things that we know are the physics of real cameras that don't really get, that don't occur, or at least don't occur in the same way um, in a simulator uh, or particularly a low fidelity simulator like we were using. And so those things are like chromatic aberration, blur, exposure levels, noise, and then also some color tones. And what we did is we used the physics of those things, which we understand quite well, because we understand why chromatic aberration happens, we understand why happens, we understand how exposure affects a camera, we understand how noise on the CCD or CMOS uh, affects the underlying distribution of those things. And so we produced a GAN system that used those parameters in their physical sort of form to, to attempt to match or to generate um, uh, images that match some other underlying real distribution. So there's a real image batch, and then we have our input image, which then gets uh, permuted by these uh, effects. And then we have a discriminator, obviously, in a GAN framework to determine if it's real or augmented. So that cycle runs in a loop, and we produce images that we hope are more uh, photorealistic or closer to the underlying distribution that we're trying to test in. So that's an image with no augmentation. That's one with chromatic aberration over and around the right. And hopefully over Zoom even, you can see the chromatic aberration that occurs on the edges of uh, the light poles and the edges of cars. Um, there's a close-up, um, so there's some chromatic aberration. Uh, you know, and then again, we would try to do things like take things like virtual kitty and make it look like cityscapes. Um, so those are the original images over there on the left and the augmented images over there on the right. Um, yeah, great, original image, augmented images, great. This is cityscapes to kitty, so you can do it between data sets. So uh, original images, augmented images, cityscapes uh, to kitty style. Great. Okay, so all that sounds exciting. 
working, but I really want to focus, spend some time talking about the limits because that work is all done and we've learned a lot about what I think doesn't work or where there are some challenges, right? So one of the fundamental things we really ran up against is that simulation has these issues around visual fidelity, right? And ultimately, we have these real questions about how close we're ever going to get. Video games are getting better and better and better, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to end up with uh, visual simulators that are improving our um, detection or tracking or whatever algorithms uh, to the degree we need them. And I'll talk about one of the reasons why. So when we looked at GTA 5 and we hacked in GTA 5 and spent a bunch of time doing that, and I would suggest you don't, it's a real pain. It was really annoying. Every time they updated it, everything broke. Um, but the reality is that there were, you know, a uh, hundred million dollars worth of artists that spent time working on the visual fidelity of GTA 5. And and uh, a real tip of my hat to everybody working on projects like Carla, Carla and other things. Um, and I think they're beginning to bring in artists, but it is challenging to think that they will bring in $100 million of artists and be able to update that in the way that sort of um, things like GTA did. But ultimately, I'd also point out that maybe we are really uh, bumping up against some real limitations of the way we think about video game pipelines and how that compares to what we need in visually um, salient uh, uh, simulators, right? Uh, so anyways, noodle on that, but $100 million in artists seems like a tough sell. Uh, sim to real, right? So uh, we did some early work on this. Lots of other people are working on it in lots of lots of different ways, but just some of the visual aspects of this, one of the things that we've been really focused on is understanding these sort of limits around distribution. So you saw that work that I was talking about from Alexa, where she's thinking about moving from one distribution of images to the other. We really think that there are some fundamental limits to this. And one of the things that we've bumped up against, and I um, you know, encourage researchers that are thinking about this now to noodle on, is that it is unclear to me that we are capable of learning um, much about the distributions of other data sets that goes beyond what we already know in our classifier. And let me explain what I mean by that. So we would train on one data set of simulated images, and then we'd want to test on like, let's say cityscapes or kitty or whatever. And so we would attempt to move to that distribution but what, what I think we really struggled with is that I, I, I don't believe that there, we, we ended up fundamentally knowing a ton more about the kitty distribution of whatever using those sort of uh, GAN-like approaches. And so I think there's still a lot of work to be done to understand if we're actually injecting any new information using particularly these kind of like picks to pick style methods, um, or are they producing things that, yeah, maybe look a little bit more like X or Y or Z, but ultimately you're kind of nibbling around the edges and not really getting at one of the big challenges. And then finally physics, the physics of uh, every single simulator that we use uh, are pretty garbage. Uh, they don't really match reality. Um, uh, and it's not clear to me that without supercomputing and a long time that they are gonna match reality. So the question becomes, how do we use uh, the fact that we know many of the physics of the real world are gonna be so dramatically different than uh, the simulators we have um, and say that that's okay. And so hopefully I think there's some other talks coming up where people are gonna kind of uh, dive into this. Uh, but I do think this is one of the biggest uh, impediments uh, holding back the field. So uh, that's me. I will I'd be happy to take some questions in the last couple minutes uh, of my time.